We have some new people, so welcome, and some returnees, so thank you. Um, today's topic is portion distortion and substitutions, um, brought to you by Alexis Roberts with the University of Georgia Extension Fulton County. And replacing Elizabeth Puckett today is Christina Rand. She's with Fulton County Library Systems Adult Outreach Program, and me, Jessica Howes, I am your wellness coordinator, Ms. Christina. Um, so today, what we're going to do, I'll give you a little housekeeping information, and then we'll go into a play-by-play -play of um, everything, uh, what's going to happen today. So for the housekeeping items, uh, this is being recorded, and so the recording and all the resources we discussed today will be sent to you in a few days. And then, so the play-by-play, -play, so I will go over all the different wellness um, communication resources Fulton County has for us. Um, discuss upcoming activities and then turn it over to Alexis for the presentation and then Christina will talk about resources, library resources on portion control and, and substitutions. All right, so our first wellness communication resource is the employee Facebook page and you can access that one or two ways using the link that's provided or just search Fulton County employee and you'll be able to get it that way. Um, Wellness information is posted Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, with Monday being about motivation, Wednesday on um, nutrition, and Fridays on fitness. The other one is Fultco News, and that is published every Monday and Thursday, and you'll receive it in your Fulton County issued email. And then Mobile Health Consumer. This is available to employees and retirees, and you can either download it on your smartphone, or you can use your PC and use the link provided and you'll be able to set up your account that way. And mobile health, I've always talked about how it's such a great tool, but it's one of my favorites because it has so many resources all in one place. Uh, you can have your um, benefits information, actually your insurance card on the app, health education, there's reminders are sent. And then one of my favorite things is uh, there's challenges and employees can be rewarded for doing different things. They have quarterly challenges, they have physical challenges like step challenges, but with the quarterly challenges, it could be as simple as brushing your teeth and you get points for that, or just going outside, getting points, taking a walk, you get points. So there's a lot of things that you can do to get points and then you're rewarded for it with prizes. So let me tell you, uh, we'll go into our um, different wellness activities that are coming up. So today is the last day that we are doing the wellness webinars. We're going to move into doing cooking demonstrations for the rest of the year. So October 7th, November 11th, and December 2nd from 1230 to 1 each time, we will be doing cooking demonstrations. So you'll get the demo and then you'll get a recipe card sent to you in a, uh, those few days later. And just like you did today, you will log it or excuse me, email employee wellness at FultonCountyGA.gov and then the Zoom link and resources will be sent to you that way. All right, so mobile health. Just got done talking about that, about some of the quarterly challenges and the well-being journeys is their most recent type of challenge that they, they're offering. Um, so what it is, you do assessments and you can learn about yourself, learn a little bit about yourself, about your nutrition needs, resiliency, stress, sleep, physical activity, financial well-being and social well-being. So what you do, you do assessments. Um, they'll give you some helpful tips and tools on what to do with those your needs. And then by doing those assessments, you get points. And at the end of the quarter, which we're finishing up a quarter at the end of this month, whoever, the, the group who has the most points will be entered into a raffle to win a Fitbit. And then we have the physical activities. So we have a fall foliage tour step challenge starting October 4th. And what it is, it's, you, it's not only just doing steps, it's re running, um, biking, any type of exercise, they have a conversion chart that you can convert into steps. And you'll, each day you'll log in your steps, you can either manually log it in or you sync up your device with the app and it'll automatically upload. So for those who complete the four week challenge, um, will be entered into a raffle and then um, be rewarded with a Fitbit. And then right after that challenge is finished, is we're going to do the Maintain Don't Gain, and that starts November 6th, and it's a six-week program. And it's really important that we, that we have this Maintain Don't Gain challenge because um, at the, on average, Americans gain one to five pounds over the holidays, so this challenge is, will definitely be timely. But what you'll do is at the beginning of each week, you're going to record your weight. 
get helpful tips and tools. But the goal is for those, the goal is for not to lose weight or either maintain your weight. And for those who do that, will be entered into a raffle to win a Fitbit belt. And then Total Brain, that is brought to us by Kaiser. So big thanks to Kaiser. And it's available to all employees, regardless if you're with um, Anthem, Kaiser, or Wade employee. Um, but it's a mental, mental well-being tool. Do different assessments, breathing exercises. Um, you, by doing all those, you get points. And at the end, whoever has 2,000 brain points at the end of each quarter will be entered into a raffle. And thanks to Kaiser, they're rewarding those winners with the $25 Amazon gift cards. So if you are participating in this quarterly challenge, then it's going to end on September 3rd. Go ahead and get those um, brain points in. And, and just continue along with the whole theme of well-being, the physical well-being. Big thanks to Kaiser because what they've done is they have a virtual fitness class um, library for us now. So at the bottom of it, you see the link and all you have to do is click on it and you'll have access to pre-recorded videos. You can do total body workouts, yoga, stretches, ergonomics, help you with chair exercises. So when we've been sitting at our desks, help you with that. So that's, again, that's free. And then for Kaiser members only, you have access to what they call, what's available, class pass. And the on-demand, they have 4,000 on-demand videos at no cost. And, but if you decide you want to do um, go to in-person classes or live streaming, they give you a 20% discount. So what you all need to do is go onto your, the kp.org website onto your account and enter the kp.org backslash exercise and you'll have access to that. And then the mental well-being, really important. We have the um, total brain tool, but then also um, Kaiser and Anthem both have available the Calm app and an app for meditation, mental resiliency, and sleep. And to you, they have um, meditation, they have videos, um, they're available. And then My Strength is an app that approves your awareness and adapt to life. So it helps managing depression, stress, anxiety. So really, really good tools. And thanks to Kaiser and Anthem for those. All right, so talked about all the different um, fit or the wellness activities that we have available. I'm gonna turn it over to Alexis. Awesome, thank you so much, Jessica. You are welcome. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right, um, so thank you guys so much for joining us today on this rainy Thursday. It's almost Friday, which is always exciting. Oh, is my thing not going? Okay, here we go. Can you see my slides okay, Jessica? Let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Oh, let me do that. Oh, okay, hold on. Here we go. Okay. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, so my name is Alexis Robert, and I am the Family and Consumer Sciences Agent with UGA Extension um, in Fulton County. So essentially what my job with UGA Extension in Fulton County is I'm a community health worker. Um, educator, excuse me. Um, and so I teach classes in nutrition, food safety, food preservation, financial literacy, and healthy housing. Um, I'm also a registered dietitian, so I always really enjoy talking about nutrition, and I'm excited to talk to you guys today. So today we're going to talk about portion distortion and substitutions. So how many of us say, I know what to eat, I just eat too much of it, right? So sometimes it isn't always what we're eating, but it's more about how much that we're eating. So why do we need to control our portions? So we know that's important to control our portions for weight. So just by having about 100 to 200 extra calories in a day can result to 10 pounds of weight gain in a year. So we can easily increase our portions just by just a few extra cups or teaspoons or tablespoons depending on the food, and we can increase it by 100 to 200 calories. So it's really important for weight control, especially as we age and we get older. As we get older, it's harder to control our weight. It's also gonna be really good for blood glucose control. So as we also get older, that does increase our risks um, for diabetes. So half of controlling diabetes is honestly just controlling how much carbs enters our body into one time at one time. And then also we wanna make sure that we get the nutrients we need, but not too much of the nutrients we don't need because they can adversely affect our health. So our quiz. So I have a quiz that we're gonna do. Ah, real quick. Um, so I have a poll. So you can participate through this, through the chat. 
Um, so this is a quiz. So a bagel 20 years ago was about three inches in diameter and it was 140 calories. How many calories do you think are in today's bagel? Okay, you guys are quick. Those are some good, some quick responses coming in. I'll wait maybe just one or two more seconds. Half of us have voted. Okay, so I will, any more, anyone? All right, final call. All right, so I will share the results. So you guys were right. So the majority of us were right. There are about 350 calories now, and they're about six inches. So essentially, we've almost, we've basically doubled the size um, of our bagel and also the calories too. All right, so I have another one that we're gonna do. All right, so this is about spaghetti and meatballs. So a portion of spaghetti and meatballs 20 years ago had 500 calories. How many calories do you think are in today's portion of spaghetti and meatballs? Okay, some quick responses. I'll wait one more second. Any more? Any more? All right. So once again, you guys are awesome. Um, so yeah, it's about 1,025 calories um, are the current uh, serving of spaghetti and meatballs. And normally we have about two cups now. Um, and it's actually recommended to just have a cup of pasta. And typically we have, well, with spaghetti, it would be recommended to have one cup, but typically we have two. So good job on that one. Um, and then, all right, so I'll do one more. I think I have two more actually, let's see. Okay, hopefully these will be a little bit more challenging. All right, so we have coffee. So a cup of coffee with milk and sugar 20 years ago was about eight ounces and had 45 calories. Of course, this is gonna vary because different people um, put different amounts of sugar and cream into their coffee, but how many calories do you guys think are in today's mocha coffee? What would you say? All right, so it is actually, share the results, it's 350 calories are in today's kind of mocha coffee, your typical coffee. So our coffee size has also increased, so we used to drink eight ounces, now we drink 16. And so in order to walk off that morning coffee, you would need to walk for about, if you're walking kind of like a mild pace, you need to walk for one hour and 20 minutes just to work off your morning coffee. And that's a lot just for the start of your day and you haven't had breakfast yet. Okay, so our last one. I know there's not a lot of this going on right now, but so a box of popcorn had 270 calories 20 years ago. How many calories do you think are in today's tub of popcorn? All right, so I think everyone's that's voted. Okay, awesome. So it is about, I'll share the results. It's gonna be about 630 calories for a tub of popcorn. So once again, of course, that's gonna vary um, based off of how much butter that you add and things like that. So if you think about you're going to the movies, typically anytime we're doing another activity and we're eating, we are gonna have some mindful, or it's gonna be harder to have mindful eating. Um, so we can easily just go to the movie theater and have three, uh, 630 calories. All right, thank you guys so much for um, that. Are there any thoughts? Um, please feel free to participate in the chat or anything like that if you have anything to share. So essentially what we know is that our portion sizes have definitely changed over time, right? Um, and unfortunately, we know that we're also a little bit more inactive than we have been over time as well, and these aren't really great combinations. Um, so another thing, sodas have increased, muffin sizes, cheeseburgers, and all of those things. So when we talk about portion sizes, and, um, it's really good to know the difference between a portion size and a serving size. So a portion is how much you would have at that one time. So if I have spaghetti and I end up having two cups of spaghetti, that's my portion. But your serving size is kind of based off of a nutrition label, and what is one considered one serving. So for this soda, what is considered one serving of a soda currently is about eight ounces. But 
they sell them in 20 ounce bottles and that would be one portion because typically you consume or most people consume the entire bottle. So there's a big difference between what our serving size is and what our actual portion size is. And so ideally we wanna get our portion sizes a little bit closer to our serving sizes. So common serving sizes that kind of people don't know about. So we already talked about that. We know our serving sizes have gotten bigger and a lot of us kind of don't adhere to what's recommended or what's the standard portion size, excuse me, serving size. So a big one I like to point out is rice and pasta. So um, when we consider diabetes, a serving size is actually one third of a cup, um, which is a little bit smaller than one half. Um, but for most people, it's gonna be at one half of rice or pasta. When you think about like the last time you got rice or you had pasta, I'm pretty sure we all had more than half a cup. Typically we end up having a cup or more. I remember one time I went to um, one of those sushi bowl places and I was like doing a diabetes workshop where we like wrote down everything we ate. And so I had to go back and I had to think, wow, how much rice was that in my kind of like sushi bowl? And I had to find it online. And just in the lunch serving, like the regular serving size or portion size, there was like a large above that. They gave me one and a half cups of rice and a serving size is a half cup. Um, so one small piece of fruit, normally we say use your fist of your hand. Um, so if you have really large apples or any large, like super large fruit, that could typically be two servings. Um, so about one melon, one wedge of a melon, three fourths cup of juice, one cup of milk or yogurt, um, two ounces of cheese, which is about the size of a domino. So I think when I do those like cheese and charcuterie boards that I'm definitely eating way more than my serving size of cheese. And then if we think about meat, it's about two to three ounces, which is the palm of your hand um, or a deck of cards. Um, another one that's not on here that I think that people kind of overdo it on um, is avocados. So we know that avocados can be really healthy, right? That they have your healthy fats, um, but they are nutrient dense. So they're healthy fats and have some great nutrients, but they do have a significant amount of calories. And so a uh, serving size of an avocado is actually about a third of it or just like, you know, two to three slices. And so I know when I've like cooked with people and I do avocados, you know, sometimes you split the whole thing and that's not recommended. So portion control is in the size of our hands. So we can use our hands to do portion control. So like we said, the size of protein, I put some size of our palm for a protein or a starch serving, the fifth size um, for fresh fruit, um, and then also for milk too. And so it's always good to try to not pile your food too high in portion control. So just don't pile your food, period. And then also try to make sure that anything you're doing is no thicker than a deck of cards or the thickness of your palm. So this is from another slide if you were from our Right Bite with Diabetes class, but these are just other ways to also help control portion control. So eat slowly. Um, so a lot of times we're really hungry and if we eat really quickly, it's really hard to gauge how full we are. So it's better to eat slowly. You wanna last, your, your meal should last at least 20 minutes. And you wanna focus on food quality and not quantity. You know, I think about this when the holidays are coming up and you know there are just so many foods that you like or that are available, but think about what you really want and then kind of spend your calories more on those foods. We definitely don't want to skip meals because um, we're more likely to overeat when we do that. And we want to make sure that we have a lot of fiber because high fiber helps to keep us full. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. And then drink water in between our meals. So with large portions, um, so when we eat out, a big thing of portion control is going to be eating out. So we know when we eat out that typically our portions are even larger. Um, so like I said, I teach a diabetes class and we have like a portion or we have a calorie amount for when you make your own french fries and versus when you eat out. And anytime we eat out, we're going to have more calories, we're going to have more fat, we're going to have more sodium, and we're going to have more carbs. So in order to do that, when we're eating out, it's gonna be better to eat off the senior menu if you can, or the kids menu. I just went to um, Chick-fil-A the other day and I got the kids menu. And you kind of learn of like, do I really need the eight count? Like six count is like plenty too. And then that way I can still have fries, but I'm not having a huge portion of them. 
You can split a meal with a friend or take half of the meal home. I definitely take half of the meal home. I feel, I always say I'm balling on a budget. Um, so anything I eat out for lunch or for dinner, like I'm having for lunch the next day, or if I get it for lunch, I'm having it for dinner later. And then also create your own plate is a great option. And you also wanna make it hard to overeat with portions. It's very hard to kind of figure out how much you're eating if you're eating with your fingers. So you think about like the chip bowl or chips and dips and things like that. So you can use chopsticks or cut your fruit into smaller pieces or even eat your sandwiches with a knife or fork or even pizza. And you wanna limit your convenience food and eating out. And when you shop, you always wanna use a shopping list and then freeze your leftovers. And then always use smaller plates, cups, and bowls. We know that basically the bigger the utensil that we have for eating or our vehicle for eating, so our plate, our cups, or bowls, the bigger they are, just we eat with our eyes. And so we're gonna want to fill it up. Um, I always like to give the example of a study in University of Central Florida. Um, and they did a study on popcorn and people's consumption of popcorn. And so they gave people medium and large containers of popcorn, but some people got regular popcorn and then some people got stale popcorn, 14 day old popcorn. And what they found was even when people got the 14 day old popcorn that doesn't taste good, just because they had a larger container, they still ate about 30% more. So even if food doesn't taste good, just because we have a larger container, we're more likely to eat more. Okay, so in terms of substitutions, um, there are a few different things that we can do to help cut down on calories and increase our nutrients through our cooking by just making small changes. So we're gonna talk about how to cut down on carbs, how to reduce and change our fat, how to cut the salt and increase our fiber. So just some things to think of when you're modifying recipes. Um, always kind of experiment before you serve at a special occasion. So if you're trying out a recipe for the first time, may not be you know, a great idea to share it with friends. friends. Um, change one or two ingredients at a time if you have a long list of recipes because based off what you're changing, it may change the way that it turns out. And then always um, expect to try it more than once. Okay, so there are essentially four principles that we can do to make our foods healthier. We can substitute an ingredient. So we can change maybe something that's not so healthy and make it a healthier ingredient. We can reduce or eliminate an ingredient. So I can say, oh, I don't think I need the salt in this dish today. I can add an ingredient. So this is a great way to add some nutrients to our food so we can add um, vegetables or we can add fruits and things like that. Um, I think that's always one of the easiest things that we can do. Like if you think about cooking eggs, you could just easily add tomatoes to that or spinach, um, or we could always kind of add to our plate in a positive way. And also prepare food with a different cooking method. So what are our common carbohydrate ingredients? So typically our common carbohydrate ingredients are gonna be things like your flour, your sugar, honey, syrup, dried fruit, starchy vegetables, and dairy foods. And so how can we cut sugar out of a recipe? So you do wanna be careful when cutting sugar out of a recipe because sugar does, I mean, some recipes have very important properties, especially in baking. Um, just by reducing your sugar, sometimes in baking, it's gonna affect the quality of your product because sometimes sugar influences how things rise. Um, and also the texture of that product. But typically you can use about one fourth to one third less. Um, you can try a sugar substitute. If you're baking, you can try Splenda for baking or there are other kind of baking alternatives as well. And instead of using sugar, you can also do like a cinnamon or a nutmeg. Um, to lower sugar ingredients, you can do a fruit and juice or light syrup. This is a huge difference. Um, there's typically about a 40 calorie difference between kind of your heavy syrup fruits and your light syrup fruits or your fruits that are in juice. So you either want to do juice or light. Light typically means it has like some sort of artificial sweetener in it. But if you like that, that's okay to you. But normally I think it's just better to do it in juice. Um, Sugar-free pudding or just low sugar fruit spreads. So like if you like jelly or things like that, just any a lower sugar option. Um, another great way is to substitute non-starchy vegetables for rice and potatoes. Um, so I am a huge pulled pork person. Um, not like huge, but I enjoy it when I have it. I, mean, I don't have it very often. But even just, you know, not having that bread and just having like the actual meat and then maybe getting a salad or something on the side 
or um, I make turkey burgers the other day and I was like, you know, I don't really want a bun today. Um, so I just put it, I just had it by itself and then had a salad. Um, so you don't always have to have that rice or that pasta or that bread that goes with that dish. You can just kind of have it, the meat by itself. Um, so you can top your casserole with thin coating of chopped nuts instead of breadcrumbs, or we can dilute juice with diet sodas or seltzer um, and things like that. Um, do you guys have any other ideas to help cut carbs? So carbs, like we said, are um, breads, um, milk. We'll talk about cream and milk in a second. Flour, so you can also substitute different types of flours and make them healthy, healthier as well. Okay, so modifying fat. So there are a few different ways we can modify fat. So we can either change the fat in the recipe or we can actually cut it out. Um, so why change this fat? So I gave this example. Um, so you can do it to reduce saturated fat and the trans fat in the recipe. Um, reduce dietary cholesterol, and also increase your unsaturated fat. So I chose this bread and this butter here. So when you think about bread and butter, do you always have to butter your bread? Is it absolutely necessary? Um, and then do you have to use butter? And we'll talk about that in a second. So how can you change the fat? So you can use oil instead of um, oil or soft margin instead of solid fat. So we say that if it's liquid at room temperature, um, that is going to be a healthier fat than something that's solid. So if you think about your fats that are liquid at room temperature, these are going to be like your olive oil, canola oil, and vegetable oils. And even soft margarines are actually going to have less saturated fat than um, things like butter and even coconut oil. So I remember a couple years ago, there was a lot of rave about coconut oil and how it's healthy for you. Coconut oil actually has more saturated fat in it than butter. And if you think about coconut oil, it is solid at a room temperature. So using nuts um, and avocados instead of cheese. So if you're doing like a taco bowl, instead of adding cheese, you could add an avocado to it. Or another thing you could actually do is you could change your cheese. Um, so we, when we were kind of doing in-person classes, we would do like a taste test with this class. And so we would normally have people try um, kind of regular cheese and then reduced fat cheese. And we did it in like a blind kind of taste study kind of way. And people typically were not able to clearly identify the low fat cheese versus the regular fat cheese. So that's another option too, is to actually just choose a reduced fat cheese. Um, we also did it with ranch too. So if you think about ranch can contain a lot of fat. So we did a study or just kind of a test with um, regular ranch and reduced fat ranch. And we found that people were hard, did have a hard time identifying the difference in those. So that's always an option. Um, so also having nuts and cooked cereal in your pancakes and waffle. And then oil and vinegar for your salad dressing. So this is um, when you're baking. One thing that you can do, say if your recipe calls for one cup of shortening, we know that shortening does contain a solid, of, a lot of saturated fat, and we call our saturated fat is our heart clogging fat. Um, so what you can do is you can actually substitute one cup of shortening for three-fourths cup of oil, and that can be a healthy substitution. You can also, instead of oil, use applesauce, and that's a healthy substitution as well. So when we cut the fat, we can use typically about one-fourth to one-third less fat in recipes. Um, and then also, by the way that we prepare our foods, we can cut the fat as well. Um, so seasoning with low sodium broth. So instead of kind of adding fat back, if you're making something, um, adding cooking it in a broth can add a ton of flavor or even just with onions and garlics and herbs and spices. And then also when we prepare our food, going ahead and cutting away the fat can make a really big difference too. Okay, so we wanna make sure we're using, um, choosing lower sodium protein. So you can do an egg white or a low cholesterol egg substitution. Um, we always recommend using a low fat or reduced fat cheese. Um, so there can be a big difference in that too. So if you think about just whole milk versus skim milk, there's normally a 40 calorie plus difference in that. Um, so using leaner ground beef, not only are you gonna reduce your calories, but also your saturated fat. Um, loin cuts of beef and then skinless protein, um, skinless poultry, excuse me. 
So the entire skin of chicken actually contains a decent amount of saturated fat. I was, um, I worked part-time as a clinical dietitian in a hospital. And so I was like kind of going over these heart recommendations with someone. And he was like, no, like I'm all into lean proteins. Like I, all I eat is chicken. And I said, yeah, do you take the skin off the chicken when you eat it? And he was like, no, that's the best part. And I was like, well, you're annoyingly getting a lot of saturated fat by still having that skin on the chicken. And these aren't to say like you can never have skin on your chicken again or anything like that. But if it is something that you're eating very frequently, you do want to be aware of that. Um, and then also just having more um, fish and seafood. Those are going to be lower proteins. And then also subs instead of actual meat protein, having beans or legumes and things like that um, can help to cut down. So this is an example of a cream substitute that you can do. So evaporated milk, milk, excuse me, it can serve as a substitute for cream or whole milk in a recipe. Um, it also can be a really good creamer in your coffee. Um, and you can even use it like whipped cream um, to make whipped cream. So you just have to make sure that the evaporated skin milk is really cold, it has to be ice cold, and you can whip it and it'll actually whip and make whipped cream, which is gonna have less calories and less fat than um, using heavy cream, heavy whipping cream to make that cream. But if you do use evaporated skim milk um, to make whipped cream, you do have to make sure that you use it kind of right away. Does anyone have any other ideas for cutting fat that they would like to share? And I would say another one is to just really measure it out. Um, so for each teaspoon or ta each tablespoon of oil is over 100 calories typically. Um, and a lot of times we don't need as much oil to cook with that we think we do. Um, especially if we're sauteing something, kind of a little bit can go a long way. Or most of us have non-stick skillets, so it's kind of recommended to do a cooking spray more so than even just adding actual oil. Um, and that can also reduce your oil and fat intake as well. So yeah, so cauliflower rice would be a good one. Um, that would be a really good carbohydrate substitution that we were talking about earlier. Um, so it's going to have a little bit more nutrients um, and then not as many calories as rice would. So that's a great example of one. Okay, so cutting the sodium. So cutting sodium is really important. So most people um, with diabetes also have high blood pressure and with sodium is gonna increase our blood pressure. Um, it's estimated that one in 10 people in America have diabetes, but it's also um, predicted that one in three people um, in America have high blood pressure. And so high blood pressure can increase the risk for diabetes complications, and then also high blood pressure can create other complications in the body. So salt is an acquired taste, and that is something that actually changes over time really easily. So how long do you guys think it would take to get, loose, get used to lower sodium? You can do it in terms of weeks in the chat if you wanted to guess. How long do you think it would take your body to adjust to a lower sodium lifestyle? Okay, two weeks, six months, three to four weeks, one week, three weeks. Okay, you guys are really close. So it only takes about two to three weeks for your body to get used to on um, the lower sodium diet. So it's a lot less time than we think. And when we think about making changes throughout our whole life, two or three weeks, is a kind of a smaller amount of time. So it definitely can be done. So how do we cut our salt? So one of the ways is to not salt cooking water. Um, when we make cereal or rice or pasta or vegetables, I think about, I did this um, canning class with chefs, uh, it was like a year or two ago. And one of the first things that they did when they made their, we just were canning carrots, one of the first things they did was just like add all this salt. And I was like, why, why are you doing that? This isn't even the right salt to use, but that's just what they were so used to was like, oh, I have these carrots, um, I'm gonna add some salt to them. So we can kind of cut back by doing that, um, by also using lower sodium canned goods um, and frozen foods. So with frozen foods, you do really wanna be aware of the sodium. Um, so if you think about your frozen meals that come ready to go, we know that sodium is a preservative, right? And so those like your Stouffer meals, not to call them out, sorry, your ready-to-go lasagna meals or your ready-to-go kind of Chinese meals, like all of those contain a lot of sodium. 
And then with canned goods, the good thing about that is we can actually rinse them and reduce the sodium by about 30%. So we can also use more fresh foods and we're gonna have less sodium. And then we really want to avoid having processed meats like lunch meat, bacon, or ham. Um, we know that some processed meats are actually linked to increased risk for cancer. Um, we don't exactly know why. We don't know if it's because of the salt or the sodium. We don't know if it's because of the nitrates, but there is um, a correlation to that. And so we really want to make sure we're not having those very often. Like I know when I was a kid, my mom sent me off like anywhere I went with, you know, a bologna sandwich, but we really don't recommend that anymore, having those too often. So lower sodium condiments, so low sodium ketchup, um, reduced soy sauce, hot sauce, Worcestershire sauce, or low sodium pickles. So just kind of watching out for those, especially with soy sauce that contains a lot of sodium. And then also making some of your own sauces can even cut down on fat as well. Um, so recently I do my own like chicken nuggets now sometimes, and I've made my own um, honey mustard sauce um, and things like that. I make my own like, you know, sometimes I make my own sushi bowls, so I make my own kind of like spicy mayo, and I use light mayo when I do it. Um, and that cuts down on fat too. And that's another thing, I just kind of started buying light mayo and I don't miss the regular mayo flavor. Like I can't even think like, oh, this isn't good. Like I still enjoy it just the same, even though it's like mayo. So with wine and lemon is actually a really good option too. Um, so I know that sometimes they can be a good salt substitute because they're gonna add a lot of flavor and they actually naturally contain potassium and chloride um, that is used as a salt substitute. So you don't wanna use cooking wine because cooking wine actually contains sodium. So you wanna use regular wine. I know that some people don't like to use regular wine when they cook. Um, by the time that you cook, you do end up using cooking out all of the alcohol, but you do keep a lot of that really good flavor. So this is gonna be really good to use in casseroles or on meats. Um, I know one time someone served me fish and I thought it was a little bland. And they're like, no, you gotta squeeze the lemon on it. And then when I squeeze the lemon on it, the taste like definitely changed. Um, so those are really good substitutes and also limes. Um, if you're kind of cooking with some sort of like kind of Mexican or Latina flavored dish, um, just adding a little lime on top of that can really make it really good. And then we wanna always make sure that we're working on increasing our fiber. So we know as we as Americans are lacking in a lot of different things, but we really need to work on increasing our fiber. So fiber is gonna be really important because it helps us to feel full. And we know that when we feel full, kind of from healthy reasons, um, we're more like, we're less likely to eat a lot at our next meal. We can go longer without eating. And then when we're full and we're not super hungry, we can make healthier choices. Um, adding fiber won't raise our blood sugar, our blood glucose. So if you have diabetes or that's something you're worried about, it's gonna release slower in the body, so it won't raise your blood sugars. Um, and they come with healthy nutrients. So in fiber, we have proteins, we have antioxidants. Um, fiber can also help to lower our cholesterol. Um, so it's something that's really good for us and also promotes regularity. And it's really good for our gut and helps us to kind of push things through throughout our body. So foods that contain the most fiber are actually gonna be our beans, peas, and lentils. So this is another great way we talked about proteins before and kind of cutting down on calories and proteins, but substituting those meat proteins for these beans, lentils, and peas, not only are they high in fiber, but they're actually really high in protein too. And so they have about five to eight servings, excuse me, five to eight grams of fiber per serving, which is a lot. You can think about a, a serving of bread, like my whole wheat bread I have in there, I think it has like three grams of fiber and that's like almost kind of like the max I've seen it. Like typically your average bread has about two or three, but the serving of these has about five or eight um, grams of fiber. So other vegetables too. So anytime we can add additional vegetables um, to casserole, stews or soups or salad is gonna be a really great sign. Um, we always wanna make sure we try to do the, no, the non-starchy ones. Um, but the non-starch ones are going to be lower in fiber, but they're going to be lower in calories too. So with whole grains, so it's recommended that half of our grains be whole grains. So or we can use whole grain flour instead of white flour. 
So it's not a 100% go-to, you do have to get the ratio right, um, but that definitely is an option. So if you're making pancakes or things like that from Saturday morning breakfast, you can use whole grain flour or kind of mix it so that you're getting more fiber in those pancakes. You can do whole grain cereal um, to, coat, to coat oven fried foods. So instead of breadcrumbs, doing whole wheat pasta. Um, when I first started doing whole wheat pasta, I found that I didn't super enjoy it, but I think you just have to get the right brand um, and then you get used to it. Um, if whole grain, I know some people like don't like brown rice or they can't get with whole wheat yet. So multigrain is a great option too. Um, just if you're like, think of it in a spectrum, like there's kind of your white foods or your white breads, your white rice and things like that. And this is your whole grains, your brown rice, kind of multigrain is in the middle. So it's a great step on your way to getting to brown rice. So wild rice is always good. Um, so just adding whole grains to our diet. And then also experimenting with other different types of grains you haven't before. So instead of rice, maybe trying quinoa or bulgur or barley. And I found that if you actually cook these in like a low sodium, like chicken broth or a vegetable broth, it adds a lot of really good flavor um, to them. So with fruit, we always want to make sure that we try to eat our fruit um, and not drink it. So that chewing mechanism is really good for our mind. Um, and then also anytime we have a juice, it's going to be higher in calories um, as well, and it's going to have more sugar. So also using fruit for topping with pancakes, waffles, and toast. So that's a healthier substitution. You can use it for a sauce with meat or poultry, or you can actually add it to quick bread. So instead of just having a regular muffin, I could have a blueberry muffin. And then with nuts, you can use that for toppings of cereals, um, nut butters. With those and nuts, I always say you do have to make sure you pay attention to the portion size um, or your serving size, right? Um, so the recommended serving size for nuts is actually the palm of your, it's not the whole palm, but it's like the palm of your hand cupped. So it's not very much. Like a serving size for almonds, I think is two ounces. And so nuts are one of those things that are like really healthy for us, but too much of a good thing can easily become a lot of calories. So you do wanna be mindful of that. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna keep going. Well, I guess we can, oh, does anyone have any ideas, any other ideas in that regard? Sorry, I kind of went through that really quick to add fiber. So another thing I've started doing is like even with tortillas, I've started buying like whole um, corn tortillas and that has been really good too. So three weeks, so no turkey sandwiches. So it's not to say uh, no turkey sandwiches, but we don't recommend having them every day. So you, it's, it's like really unrecommended to have like processed meats um, every day. And like the American Cancer Society recommends limiting as much as possible. I think that's hard because it's, it's kind of like a go-to. Um, but I don't, I would not recommend them eating it every day. Um, so other substitutes that you could do for that, we could talk about that, is you could have, um, you can make your own chicken um, and slice it, or you can have your own turkey and do turkey slices, um, or you could do tuna, or you could do like a chicken salad, a tuna salad, or a chicken salad, or you could put another meat in there and still kind of have that same building of a sandwich without that processed meat. So in summary, when it comes to modifying our recipes, we can always use less of an ingredient. So sometimes when I cook, I look at the cheese and I'm like, do I really need all of this cheese? Because cheese is one of those things that if you put it on at the right moment, you can make it look like a lot when there's not. So especially if you're kind of topping something with cheese, you don't have to use very much. I also always recommend measuring things out. Um, so typically we know when we eyeball it, we're wrong. Um, so if a recipe, especially if like a serving size of rice is half a cup, go ahead and get that measuring cup out and actually measure it out because that could be the difference in a substantial amount of calories and maybe, you know, 50 or 60 calories a day may not be a big deal, but you can think about that in terms of a week and then over time that does matter. So substituting an ingredient, so maybe instead of using that cheese that I mentioned, I use an avocado or maybe I use tomatoes. Um, that's one thing I found with grits like recently, like I've always been like, I'm a Southern girl, I love my grits. Um, but now I found that I actually love to like add tomatoes in them. And for some reason that creates like a lot of really great flavor 
and I don't feel like I have to even have cheese in my grits. Um, so adding an ingredient so we can add to, like we said, continuing to add nutrients, um, whether that's through vegetables or adding fruit, or instead of just having pancakes, having apple pancakes or things like that. And then also making sure that we cook the recipe differently and then that can make it healthier as well and cut down on calories. Um, so this is kind of like instead of frying it, we can bake it. I know some people ask me about air fryers and those are actually a little bit, I mean, they're better for you than frying it. Like what's better than that would be baking it because you can use less oil. But if you really like that crunchiness and you want your air fryer, then like I, I definitely say go for it. Um, you can also roast things and that can kind of elicit that air fryer response as well. And roasting things can actually change the texture and the flavor too. So that's one of the things I always recommend to people is definitely check out roasting vegetables. Um, someone said, what is the recommendation on boiled eggs? Um, so eggs are one of those things I think we all have seen have gone back and forth. Right now, basically, if your doctor doesn't have you watching your cholesterol, um, eggs are fine. Um, so boiled eggs are good too. So instead of scrambling them, boiling them could be a really great option. So depending on like how much oil you add when you scramble them, or I know my dad like always scrambles them in margarine um, too. So even a healthier alternative to that would actually be doing it in olive oil or kind of with a cooking spray or something like that. All right. Do you guys have any questions? All right, well, if we don't have any questions, I will pass the baton over to Christina um, to share with you guys some library resources. Hi, everyone. Sorry, not so smooth on this. I haven't done it in a while. All right, I'm Christina Rand. I am the Youth Outreach Librarian for the Fulton County Library System. Today I'll be showing you how to get a library card and how to access some um, online resources. And we have this lovely flyer that my colleague made, Portion Distortion and Substitutions. Um, so I'll be showing you how to access some of those things. So first we're going to talk about getting a library card. Um, from our homepage, you would, our, our homepage is at focolibrary.org. Um, you would go to services and library cards. And then there's the online library card application. And you'll fill out this online registration and click register. Um, you will receive a confirmation in your email with your virtual library account number. And you make your own PIN when you, when you fill out this online registration. So um, during curbside service only, your virtual library account will be renewed every 30 days until you pick it up. And right now, you can, um, your, your digital library account will access Libby and OverDrive apps. And those are apps to get ebooks and e audiobooks. And to access other online resources, you'll want to go to your library and get your physical library card. So, to get your physical library card, you will call your local branch once you've registered for your virtual account. And they'll ask some verifying questions and then they will change your virtual account to a physical card. Once you've had your card updated to a physical card over the phone with a staff member at your local branch, you may pick up your card by bringing ID into curbside pickup. All right, so back to our lovely flyer and um, some of the resources are from Libby and some are from um, Canopy, which is a new streaming service we have for videos. So I'm going to start by showing you how to access Libby. Um, always go back to the home page 
so that you get used to uh, where to start and for to find our resources. So down here at the center of our page are our online resources and our digital library. And we're looking at Libby today, so the one with the little girl with the purple hair. And for those of you who are um, wonder about Libby versus Overdrive, um, Libby is just a newer app from Overdrive. And um, it's better to use if you are um, just using it on a phone or something like that. But if you're using Overdrive um, all over on different devices, it's better to use Overdrive. Um, so we'll go into Libby. And when you start to um, go into your account, you will just have to put in your library card number and your PIN. When you create a virtual library account, like I said, you make that PIN up. If you have a physical library card that you already had um, and you've never changed the PIN, the PIN is change me, C-H-A-N-G-E-M-E, -E, change me. Um, until you change it. So, go back over here. The thing we're going to start looking at is intuitive eating at Libby. And unfortunately, I can see so the, this flower was made a little while ago and there must have been available copies then, but now there are zero of two copies available. Um, and you can place a hold. Um, but I wanted to show you how then you could look for other items because this one's unavailable. Um, one of the things you could do is go to subjects um, to get your subject headings and click on health and fitness. Um, and you can filter these by available now along the side. And then you can see the items that are available now to borrow, such as the Keto Reset Diet, the Whole30, Eat to Live. You can see whether or not they're ebooks or audiobooks. I'm going to go back to our flyer. Why You Eat What You Eat, also on Libby. You can see that there are three of three copies to borrow. Um, so you can borrow it immediately. You can also look, so one of their subject headings is cooking and food. So you could click on that um, and to see what you have available. Well, first I'll run down so you can see some of the things that are just there. You can see the difference between things that are not available where they have place a hold and things that are available with the word borrow in green. And here I'll show you how you could go to only items that are available now. And say you just really like audiobooks and you don't like to read ebooks. That's how you could limit that. All right, the next one from Libby that we're taking a look at is Food Politics, again by Rachel Hertz. Um, you can see that um, it's a, how the food industry influences nutrition and health. There are two copies. You can borrow it immediately. Again, you could look at cooking and food if you wanted to look at other related ebooks or e-audiobooks. Um, I'm just going to quickly show a search in here for health and fitness to show you some other items that you have access to. So the library is a great resource um, during this time and any time because it gives you free eBooks, audiobooks, movies, music, television, um, and all sorts of databases for research. All right, now we're going to look at Canopy. And so I'm going to go back to the library's homepage to start. Again, just to remind you where we come in. Um, Canopy is one of our new services, and so you'll find it at the digital library because it hasn't been a lot added along the side yet. 
if you click on digital library, scroll down a little bit, you'll see our new resources are Canopy, Creative Bug, Lynda.com, Online Book Club, Infobase, Pebble, Pebble Go, Pebble Go Next, Value Line. We'll click on Canopy. And this one, you also, um, when you start, you will just start with your library card number and your PIN, but then you'll go um, further in to make um, a different PIN for specifically for Canopy. Um, and for Canopy, you will want to go to the library card to the library and get your physical library card. Um, and back to our flyer. Food, science, and the human body on Canopy. It's 36 lectures um, that about evolution of the human diet and its relationship to our bodies. So you can see the information, you can see the running time, 36 videos all about food, science, and the human body. And again, if you want to look for other resources that are related, you can click on health, everyday health. And these are videos that you can watch on health. The next one we are highlighting is changing body composition through diet and exercise. This is another series from the great courses on Canopy. It is about the correct way to view your diet and fitness needs. Um, health and everyday health is again one of the subject headings and you can also look at health, sports and fitness to find related videos. All right. And elements of human nutrition, also on Canopy. The series explores the science and nutritional elements of food, their role in the human body, and the impact on our health. And again, their subject heading is health and everyday health. So you'll see those same videos that I showed. Six video collection of elements of human nutrition. So um, what else about the library do you need to know right now? We have a fall reading challenge. Um, you can go to fococounty.beanstack.org. You can register there. Uh, The reading program runs until November 3rd. You can register as an individual, family, or group. Uh, you need only read five titles to win uh, the challenge. Um, for each thing, you get a badge. You get a virtual badge. So you get a virtual badge for registering, for reading each title. And you, there are a number of badges you can get for continuing to read and also for doing library-related activities like checking out our online platforms. Um, also, if you are using the library for the Galileo resources for doing research from home, um, to get the Galileo password, you will um, go to your library account. So I'm gonna go here under books and materials, click on my account. I would put in my library card number and my PIN number, and then this will bring up my library account. And at the bottom of your library account record, um, there's a blue highlighted area and that shows you the current Galileo password. Uh, also, 
the library has digital programming, virtual programming every day. Unfortunately, I see that we don't have our current newsletter up, but I can show you the last one just so that you can get a sense of how we show the schedule. Uh, we have programming every day, streaming story time for children at 11 a.m. Um, on Mondays, we do kitchen chemistry, so uh, we do a recipe. Uh, on Tuesdays, we do fitness. On Wednesdays, we do kids crafts, and um, every two weeks, we do adult crafts. On Thursday, we do a language lesson, um, and then over the weekends and on Fridays, often there are book breaks where librarians will read to you um, poetry or books. And uh, we also have young adult book breaks where librarians talk up cool new young adult reads. Uh, we also have curbside service right now. Our curbside hours are Monday and Tuesday, 10 through 7, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 through 4. Uh, if you have any questions about curbside service, you can go to our library's webpage and click on here to see all of the information. All right. Does anyone have any questions about library service, online databases, online platforms, anything? I think you did a great job. Thank you so much, Christina, for presenting that information and for You're sure welcome. where all those resources are located. Thank you. Jessica, do you want to close us out? Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, thanks to Christina and Alexis. Such good information. And then don't forget, um, October 7th, that's going to start our cooking demo series. So um, email employee wellness at FultonCountyGA.gov, and you will be all set. So I'll see everybody on October 7th.